chapter 2. You'll remember from our reading that chapter 2 opens up with the introduction of Boaz. Automatically, you have to kind of go, time out, time out, time out, time out. Where did this guy come from? Who is this guy and why is he introduced first? Because if we were writing this story as Western thinkers, we would want to write in a linear fashion. We would want to say, okay, Ruth and, Ruth and Naomi came back to Israel. And then Naomi went to, or Ruth came to Naomi and said, Naomi, please let me go and glean out in the fields. That's the next thing that happens. So she goes to the field. And then she meets the servant who's in charge, and he puts her to work, but she gets tired, so she stays in the house, and he gives her a drink, and then Boaz shows up and notices her. That's the way we would write the story, because that's the chronology of the story. Not so in Eastern thought. In Eastern thought, they want to take the story and say, what do I want you to know? And they're going to build the story so that this thing rises to the top and they can just punch you right in the head with it. Boom, or the heart actually is a better way to say it. Bam, here's the truth. So chapter 2 opens up with, there was a great man of wealth named Boaz. Your hero just got introduced to you. I mean, the guy, they call it the book of Ruth. I got news for you. It's the book of Boaz, okay? The whole book is the book of Boaz. This is our type for our picture of Jesus. His name actually means standing in strength. If you were to look at the Jewish temple, there are two pillars front and center in the Jewish temple. They're, I mean, they're just these columns that rise all the way to the ceiling, and they each have a name. Guess what one of them's named? Come on, guess. Boaz. Yeah, see? Boaz. It's like this, ugh, it's just got all kinds of... Great man of wealth is really, really tough to get into English. Let's say this. He was a great man who had wealth. And great is not just character. Great is ability. He was... The, yeah, there's some other writings, and we're not going to get into what they are. It's, y'all go look up the... the Targum Onkelos, okay? You just go figure out what that is on your own and have a ball with it, okay? Yeah. T-A-R-G-U-M-O-N-K-E-L-O-S. The Targum Onkelos. Just look up Targum and you'll find a lot of them, okay? But that's, it's, th- these are Babylonian translations. These are Aramaic translations of Jewish text. That's what it is. And they take some liberties with it. They say that he was a man, he was a great man of war. You know why? Because he's great. They're trying to get across to you, this man has strength and power and wealth. He is referred to in this other writing as this judge called Ibzan the Great. He was the ruler of this region. And if you want an Aramaic name for him, it's Ibzan, I-B-Z-A-N, if you want to spell it in English, Ibzan the Great. This guy is the king of the region. Y'all get it? He's the prince of the region. He's, he's the man. Like he runs Bethlehem and Judah. And that's why we introduce him first. You have to know that power is about to show up. Strength is about to show up. Wealth is about to show up. The guy in charge. And here he is, Boaz. Now, Ruth turns around to Naomi and says, Naomi, Naomi. I don't think we're doing so good here. The text doesn't tell us where they're living, who they're living with, how they're eating. We don't know anything. We don't know. But you kind of got to think, there was something that was pushing Ruth to make this request. Can I go out into the field and try to glean some grain? Um, Context. My wife's grandfather was referred to as Paul. That's all, Paul. He lived on a dirt road in Mississippi, so far out in the middle of nowhere that the road was named after him and his family. Okay, his name was John Oliver Goforth, Johnny Goforth, and everybody, he lived on Goforth Road. Matter of fact, everybody up and down that road was pretty much Goforth. They're all kin, okay? Goforth Road. And Paul was the quintessential stereotype for everything you imagine an old Mississippi dirt road dwelling redneck to be. He just was. He kind of talk kind of like this. Hear the whistle a little bit when he talk, you know, and it's all just like. He told us a story one time. Stacy, I think maybe what I'm going to do is grow me up some pumpkins. I put them in my truck there, and then when the girls would drive by down the road, I'd go, Punky! (laughs) 
And they turn around, come back, because they think I was whistling at them, but I'm just going to sell them one there for $10. What do you think? It'll make me a little bit of money. <laughs> That's Paul, right? <laughs> John Oliver. Paul has since gone on to be in heaven. Uh, but it was a treasure to get to know him while he was here. And I look forward to continuing our conversations when we get home. Paul grew up in the Depression. Paul tells stories about working at a sawmill because he used to saw down pine trees. That's big business down in Mississippi. It was bigger business, still pretty big business. Saw down pine trees, and they'd take those logs and they'd run them off into a vat. And this vat had some water with a curing solution in it, a brine. But Paul would have to go out in the wintertime and break the ice off those brining vats. And those logs would come down the mill skin and drop off into that brining vat. And he had to grab a big hook with another, pull that log out of there and just get soaking wet. And he'd come home at night and his overalls would literally be frozen. Now, whether this is, you know, walk 20 miles uphill in the snow both ways, I don't know. Okay? But it's a story he tells. What I do know is they didn't have food. They didn't have warmth and shelter that was dry. They barely made it. Paul went to the sixth grade and he was out because he had to come back and go to work for the family to try to make enough food to feed the family. That's how life was. So one day Stacy and I are visiting Paul and we're sitting there. He's in his big chair, you know, and he's big old belly and overalls, you know, and he gets some mail. We bring in the mail. His wife had spray painted the mailbox blue for some, I don't, it's just, so we go up there and laugh at the giggle about the mailbox and we get it out and bring it in, give him the mail and he's sorting through the mail and there is an envelope. I think it was from the AARP, but I don't know for sure from somebody and they were sending out a survey and across the face of the envelope it said, give us your two cents worth, right? We've all heard that, give us your two cents worth. And in a little cellophane window in the envelope, there were two pennies. Right? Paul comes from the Depression. Paul didn't give a hoot about the survey. All the other mail goes down. The first thing Paul does, his old arthritic fingers start going after that cellophane. Boy, he's studying on it. I didn't get you. He gets those two pennies. He pulls them out and he puts them in his pocket. Two pennies. And he fought for two minutes to get them out. And he put those pennies, and Stacy was watching. We're watching in amazement while he fought for these two pennies. And she said, Paul, you got them pennies, didn't you? Yeah. He said, them pennies make dollars. And he reached his hand down in his pocket and went like that. And it sounded like Santa Claus's sleigh. Jing, 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 jing. He pulled his hand back out, and he had a wad of coins in his overall pocket. I mean, they were like, but he wasn't about to lose one of them. See, Paul lived by this ethic. Those pennies make dollars, or them pennies make dollars. Paul knew what it was not to have two pennies, and he wasn't going to let one of them escape. Welcome to the context of chapter 2. <coughs> We have just lived through at least a 10-year famine. We think it's 12. A 12-year famine has happened. Naomi has come back from Moab. But remember, this is the family that abandoned the rest of the family for greener pastures when times got hard. They weren't there to help everybody make it through. Now they come back and there are no men to offer into the workforce and she's dragging this girl who's 10 generations over cursed with her. Where are they living? I don't know. I don't know who took them in. Some people were excited. We know that from the close of chapter 1. We don't know. All I can tell you is it's every man for himself at this point. They've just come out of famine and they don't know if they're going back into famine. The fact that they have grain, they're trying to store up in case this famine happens again. In order to get the picture of what's about to happen, you have to know they come out of a post-famine culture or a post-depression culture, that's where we're living. And secondarily, there are laws that govern what you can and cannot do regarding the harvest. When the harvest comes in, if this is your field right here, you can glean, glean the entire center section of the field for yourself. But the corners and the edges are not to be touched. 
Now, you guys know, if any of you come from farming background at all, I grew up in Missouri where there was corn and soybeans. Every, that's all there was, corn and soybeans and pigs or anything else. And so you can, you can know if you come out of that culture that, what, John, you tell us, the, those little stalks of corn on the edges of the field, do they grow as good as the ones in the middle? Not even close. They're all withered up. They don't cross-pollinate. They're just pathetic little shrunk-up doodads, okay? So about 30% of the field really doesn't flourish. It's the 70% that flourishes that you get to glean because you own the field. But that 30%, you don't touch that. You let other people who don't have a field, foreigners, strangers, widows, orphans, you let them come in and glean those parts of the field. That's, that's the welfare system of Judaism. If you're willing to work, you can eat. Ah, but wait. These aren't exactly the most law-abiding citizens in the world because every seven years they're supposed to let the field rest, and they don't. We already know that. The 70 years of Babylonian captivity, that's an absolute judgment because they didn't do it. Which means they're probably not leaving all that 30% for other people. Now Ruth goes to Naomi and says, let me go into the field and glean. Y'all got the picture? A foreigner and a widow who's cursed ten times over is about to step into the field of a Jew and take food off their plate. So she goes to her Jewish mother-in-law and says, what do you think about this idea? Because the chance of her being beaten, at least, at least, mocked or scourged, cussed at, run off, at worst, raped, abused. The chance is very, 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 very high that this is going to happen. Evidently, some desperate thing has set in. I don't know. Y'all go pray your way through this text. Have a conversation with God. Figure it out for yourself. Something desperate is happening. Let me go. So she goes out to glean. She happens on the part of the field that belongs to but She happens on the part of the field <laughs> that belongs to but right? Because this is all just coincidence, right? That's just, it just, just happened to work out that she winds up in Boaz's part of the field. She's working along. Boaz shows up and he talks to the servant who is in charge. Now we have our context. We understand what's going on. Boaz ain't out gleaning, y'all. How's that for a well-formed sentence? Boaz ain't out gleaning y'all. <laughs> Boaz is not... See, all the people from Michigan and Chicago and play like Sasha's going, what did he just say, Logan? What, what's, can you interpret that? Yeah. I use guys. Okay, anyway. <laughs> try to sit. <laughs> it's low, is that bad? I'm sorry, Gideon. I apologize. Okay, anyway. Boaz is not the one in the field doing the work because he is Ibzan the Great. He is the judge. He is the prince of the region. And Boaz came from Bethlehem. A little bit of a clue, right? Our Savior, our Goel, we'll get into that word in just a minute, our kinsman redeemer comes from Bethlehem, Judah. And he says to the servant who's in charge of the reaper, what's that servant's name? Anybody? Bear, what's the servant's name? Yeah. Does anybody know Bear? See, the servant who's in charge of the reaper, the unnamed servant, and he's in charge of the reapers, the unnamed servant who's in charge of going out and bringing in the harvest, collecting the harvest, what's his name? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Y'all tell me, what's the, what's the Holy Spirit's name? Yeah, that's, that's a title, right? Is, that, is it Chip? Fred? Yeah, see, that's what he does as helper. Ichabod, what's his name? I, he doesn't need a name. He is. And it is not for him by character, ethic, and nature to draw attention to himself. It's to speak of all the things that Jesus is, that Jesus does, and that Jesus wants to communicate. He carries the message of God and... He's the one that wooed you into relationship with Jesus in the first place. The servant who is in charge of the reapers sees this foreign girl show up. 
Boaz shows up. He sees her. Wow. Now, y'all, really, you got to get here. Boaz looks out in this whole field full of people collecting grain. And what catches his eye? Who catches his eye? You think Jesus isn't just freaked out in love with you? Every time his eye meets yours, he goes, wow. Wow. And so he goes up to this servant. Now, th there's the pleasantries, right? The Lord be with you, and the Lord bless you. And you guys read in the notes that you're going to take home about all that stuff. Okay, but here's the bottom line. The first thing he wants to know after the greeting that's mandated by God, that's instructed by God, we're going to keep this orthodoxy alive. He makes that greeting, and then the next thing that happens is he says, Whose young woman is that? He doesn't say, who is that? He says, whose is she? Who does she belong to? If you and I are asked that question, here's what we say. Nobody. Not nobody. That's not what the servant in charge of the reaper said. He said, that's the young Moabitess woman who's come back from Moab with Naomi. And she was here and gleaned for a while, but she got tired, so I let her go into the house and sleep, and she's had a couple of drinks of water from the young guys. How's that for an answer? Whose young woman is that? I mean, if it's me, I'm just going, stop it. I just asked a simple question. Who does she belong to? I just want an answer. But see, the Holy Spirit is going, ah. Uh, yeah, that's that young Moabitess woman that came back from Moab. We kind of kept her eye. We just been holding her here till you showed up. Wooing her. Caring for her. Looking out for her well-being. Because we knew that you were going to show up, Boaz, and go, Wow. I think it's hilarious that at that point, Boaz is done with the servant in charge of the reapers. He, okay, young woman, listen to me. <laughs> he immediately turns his attention to her. It's like, yeah, 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 you did your job, great. Hey, listen to me. I don't think he actually pushed face the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> don't, just play along with me. His attention goes right to her because that's what has the affection of his heart. Listen to me, you'll stay here in the company of my young women, will you not? It's not good for you to go out and glean anywhere else. Why? We've already talked about it. It's not safe. You stay right here. You glean. You stay close to my young women. How does she respond? My Lord, who am I that I would find favor in your sight? I am a foreigner. I'm a foreigner. No, 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 see, I'm cursed ten generations over. You know I'm from Mo. You know who I am. And I'm finding favor. Bam, down she goes. When was the last time we saw Jesus and just collapsed over the fact that we were cursed ten times over, and yet he came straight to us and said, listen to me. Won't you? Listen. Don't leave. Stay right here. Stay close to me and mine. You stay close to my young women. She puts up her objections. I'm, why have you shown kindness to me, your maidservant, although I am not like your other maidservants? She floats this question out, and then this incredible oddity in the text happens. We snap to supper. There's not a response. He never answers it. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I would offer you this thought. The next time you want to offer that prayer to Jesus, why in the world would you fall in love with me? Don't you know who I am? I am a disgusting, ten times over cursed sinner. Chances are you're not going to hear an answer. You're just going to hear, hey, you want to come to dinner? How about a date? Because he doesn't see you that way. He's just going, wow, my God, you're beautiful. Let's have dinner. So she goes to dinner. She takes up, I mean, she's crazy not to, right? She takes up the invitation, and what do they serve at dinner? Bread and wine. 
and parched grain. Grain for sustenance, seeds of truth, bread and wine. Jesus offers communion to his bride. I'm sorry, Boaz offers communion. No, I said it right the first time, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Jesus offers intimacy. Now, I want to do something to just tweak your perspective just a tiny bit. This is a rather adult conversation, but I want you to play along and listen to it anyway. I want you to think about the most intimate act that you have with God, and I would propose to you that communion is that act. Because if this is the body and blood of Jesus, as Corinthians teaches us, it is. And if we are the bride of Christ, which we know we are, in the act of communion, the bride is receiving into herself the body of the bridegroom, the blood, the life of the bridegroom. This is intimacy. This is pure intimacy with God. This is it. And what do we see picture happening right here? I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Let me draw you close. Let me make you mine. Let me give you so much provision after we've had this moment. Let me give you so much protection that you'll go home with food. Left. You think Boaz didn't know she was tucking food away in her? Of course, you can go home with plenty. And as you leave, I'm going to go to my servants and tell them, I'm going to go to my church. I'm going to go to my maid servants. I'm going to go to my church and I'm going to tell them and my young men, my guardians, and say, watch out for her, care for her. First generation Christians, how many people walk into our company? Feel loved, provided for, protected, nourished, wanted. How many times has God whispered to us, whatever it takes, you take care of that one. I don't care what it costs you. I've got plenty. You're not going to exhaust my resources. Matter of fact, take some of what you would have for yourself, the bundles of grain, drop it on purpose onto the ground. Leave it behind for her to pick up. Don't make her feel like some... I don't even know what word to use. Tagalong, vagabond, charity case. Get her right in the middle of you and just drop some that would normally be yours. Let her pick it up. Let her collect it. Not the leftovers in the edges, the good stuff right down the middle. How many of us live that life? And I can tell you the truth, looking through the room, the answer is a lot, because I know who's here. But the church as a whole, do we stand up and declare this truth out of the book of Ruth? That those who belong to Boaz actually drop the best of the best so that the one that Boaz had his eye on would have protection, provision, a sense of belonging and wanting. Do we treat them as if they already are the thing that we hope they'll become? Because that's the best form of evangelism. Treat them as if they already are one of us. Sit back and watch what happens. So she tucked her stuff away and he says, you stay close to my young women. She tucks some food away, she goes home, she gives some to Naomi. And I love this picture of Naomi. I know it's not dead on accurate, but I like to do it anyway. There's a Jewish thing that Naomi says, blessed be God who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead, and da, da 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 because she finds out it's Boaz. But I kind of like to imagine it like, you know, the big stereotypical black grandmother? You, you know what the picture I'm talking about? Well, bless God, shut my mouth. I mean, it's just, I sort of get that exuberance out of neighbor. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. God hadn't forgotten us. It's a happy, oh, happy day. Happy day. I mean, I just sort of get that feeling because Naomi has hope. Boom, it all comes together. She's got hope. She's got hope. And she grabs, listen to me. You have no idea who this is. He's a goel. He's a close relative. This guy can make it all okay. Naomi knows something. A goel, a kinsman redeemer, is the one who has the right to execute 
Leverett Law. He can make it all okay. Not only can he make it all okay, this dude is the biggest and the baddest in the land. We're not just going to marry into okay. We're going to marry into the top. Oh, my God. We have hope. I don't know how this started, but there was something desperate that drove this girl out into a place where she could really get it handed to her if she wasn't careful. And all of a sudden, at the end of the chapter, we've got hope. And I don't mean a little bit. I mean, we've got, we've got hope because <laughs> we've got Boaz who showed up. And she goes, yeah, 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 yeah. He told me it'd be really good if I like, hung around with his young men. And then there's this little nuance. And Naomi says, yes, it would be good if you hung around with his young women. How many times do we see a little glimmer of hope and then we want to adjust the circumstances to fit what we think actually works? It was the young men that will protect me and provide for me, but that's not what he actually said. And Naomi, being wise, says, yeah, it will be good if you hang around with these young women because Boaz doesn't want to share his affections with any of his guys. He is a jealous Boaz. And I can already tell you, he wants you. Don't even pretend to present yourself to anybody else who could be a suitor. This is your guy. This is your one. There isn't another. This is it. Naomi is wise in the ways of Judaism. And she says, this is how you play this thing. In the next chapter, we're going to see Naomi sort of step up and take charge. But before we close this one, I want to make one more observation, okay? Naomi tells Ruth, we have hope. And then once again, the text says they stayed from the barley harvest through the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest comes into play. Two loaves. It's God echoing this sentiment. Two peoples. I see a Gentile and a Jew sharing in hope. I see beauty and wisdom sharing in hope. I see the old and the new weaving together to form hope. But so far, Naomi has not met Boaz. So I want to take just a minute and show you one more little oddity. And it'll play into the rest of our story going forward. It may not look like it fits right here, but it'll fit later, okay? I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you go back to the book of Genesis, and you look at the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th chapters, something very strange happens. The 22nd chapter of Genesis is the story of Abraham taking his son Isaac up to the altar to be sacrificed. Anybody unfamiliar with this story? Okay. It says that in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, it says that Abraham took his son and two men, two young men as servants, took them along. They traveled so far, and then he told the two young men, you stay here, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will return. Okay, you all heard sermons about this, right? We'll go worship and we will return. They go up. Isaac says to his dad, hey, I got the wood right here. I'm carrying the wood and I know we got fire with us, but where's the lamb? Y'all, this is just too beautiful to pass up. Isaac, the son, is carrying the wood like Jesus would carry the cross up that very same hill. This is the same place. This is Mount Moriah. This is the exact same place, exact same hill. This is Calvary that they're going up. And they're carrying the wood up this hill. And I've got the wood, and here's the fire, the testing. We've got that. Where's the lamb? And Abraham answers in a real linguistically odd way. He says God will provide himself a lamb. He doesn't say he will provide for himself or to himself. It says God will provide himself a lamb. Y'all hear it? God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide a lamb himself. 
Now, here's the oddity. You guys know all that already. That's just rehash. It says that the story plays out, and you know how to, Abraham stop, and so he got up. By the way, Isaac's not a little kid, okay? Isaac's not a little kid. He's a young man. There are people that are a lot smarter than me that think he's 33. Y'all go figure that one out. So it says that God says, stop, don't do it. There's a ram caught in the thicket. They sacrificed the ram. It says, and then Abraham returned to his two young men, the two servants, right? Did y'all hear that? What's wrong with that statement? Where's Isaac? It says, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will return. They go yonder and worship, it says, and then Abraham returned to the two young men. Where's Isaac? Where's Isaac? We fold over into the next chapter, the 23rd chapter. Ain't no Isaac. Sarah dies. Sarah, the mother of Judaism, expires. She disappears from our story. The 24th chapter of Genesis comes around. And Abraham looks at his servant, who doesn't have a name right here. He is the eldest servant who is in charge. He looks at his servant in charge who has been named. He's been named early in our story. His name is Eleazar. El, you guys already know this, right? El, 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 Elimelech. El, God is king, right? God is king. Elimelech. El, E, Ezer. God is something. God is king. That's true. We know God is king, right? Y'all want to know what El, E, Ezer means? El, Ezer? You want to know what that means? God is helper. The unnamed servant is named God as helper. And what did Jesus say? I will send the helper. Abraham looks at his oldest servant, the unnamed servant, and he says, Go into the land of our fathers and find a bride for my son. <laughs> is that not cool? Don't take my son along. Go find the bride and bring the bride to my son. And it's not until the end of the 24th chapter that Isaac reappears in our story. And the next time we see him, he's in the marriage tent with his bride. 23, Friday, Isaac disappears. 24, Saturday, Judaism slips away. Sarah's gone. I'm sorry, 22, 23, Judaism slips away. 24, Isaac reappears and has the bride. Sunday. It's all over the place, y'all. Everywhere you look, you will find the story of Jesus and his church. Everywhere you look. Jesus said, you search the scriptures diligently, for in them you think that you have life. But these are they which speak of me. The whole book is about Jesus. Why? Why did Naomi have to travel to Moab? Because if she never traveled to Moab, how would the bride have been brought back? Isn't that what Romans 9, 10, and 11 is all about? Have the Jews stumbled so as to fall? No, by no means, Paul says. Rather, their stumbling was for your benefit, so that you could be brought in. You could be, you, the Romans, you, the Gentiles, could be brought in. But make no mistake, they haven't fallen. They just slipped for a minute. Oh, they'll be back, because all Israel will be saved. Right now, we're still in a portion of the story where Naomi, she hasn't met Boaz yet. She knows there is a Boaz. She knows there is a Messiah. She knows there is a king, but she hasn't met him yet. She knows the hope of the king, but she doesn't have a relationship with him. She knows the fruit of the king, but she hasn't experienced it yet. Right now, the center point of the story is Ruth, the Gentile, who has Boaz's eye and his heart. And she says, you sit real tight. This is going to work out well. The Jew and the Gentile and the king. I love this story. I love this story. Because this story tells me that Jesus loves me. 
I get to the end of this book and I feel so cherished and admired and loved and wanted. It just drips. And it makes me smile. It should you too.